Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea remains a strongly homogeneous country, yet in recent years, there has been an increasing inflow of migrants. Workers from developing countries in Asia hope to find employment in Korea's labor-intensive industries, while highly skilled workers from OECD nations are attracted to Korea's booming financial centers and corporate headquarters. Foreigners now amount to 3.5% of the total population. One particular element of immigration in Korea, however, is the strong influx of migrant women. Faced with declining fertility rates and the rural exodus of young women looking for better prospects in urban areas, the Korean countryside, as well as cities, have been bringing in foreign brides, raising concerns about their inclusion into Korean society, the discriminations they may face, and how Korea intends to manage its newfound multiculturalism. Our guest for this episode, Sohun Lee, is a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney, focusing on the experience of migrant women in South Korea. We talk about Korea's immigration policies and their underlying ideology, the particular situation of migrant women, and what recent migration trends mean for Korean nation-building. Sohun Lee has written policy papers for UN Women and worked at the Asian Forum for Human Rights and Development. She completed her BA in Asia-Pacific Studies at the University of Toronto and earned a Master in Human Rights and Democratization at the University of Sydney. Sohun Lee, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. You have a Korean name, uh, but you pursued your studies in Canada and Australia, and your research focuses on South Korea. Where did that interest come from, and would you call yourself uh, a Korean? I was born in South Korea, so I was born Korean citizen. My family moved to Canada when I was 15, so I grew up in both countries, both um, Korea and Canada. So I feel attached to both countries, and I do call both countries home. Now it's a little complicated now because my home, of course, now is Australia, uh, where I study. I'm doing PhD studies at, at the University of Sydney, so I have three homes in three countries where I ca- call home now. Hmm. So that's a part of my lived experience of migration because it started early when I was 15 at my parents' decision to move to Canada. And since then, I've been interested in this phenomenon of people moving place of residence and calling other countries uh, where they're not born or have no previous attachment to home. And being a woman, I also became interested in unique experiences of migrant women and different social and institutional aspects that they're subject to that's uniquely women. That's pretty much where my research interests came Mm. from, um, interest in migrant women. Uh, I'm doing PhD Uh, and my topic is very much on the the topic of gender and migration, uh, and I focus on things that are specifically women, like care, reproductive work, precarious employment, and such. Yeah, so that's that's my background and how I became interested in what I'm researching. We're going to focus on migrant women in the second part of the of the interview, but first let's talk about migration in Korea uh, in more general terms. South Korea currently has the lowest fertility rate out of all the OECD nations. Um, At the same time, it faces a growing population of elderly people. And so to sustain the workforce, to provide for a welfare state, immigration would seem to be the obvious answer. Are we seeing this happen? The immigration would be obvious answer to a lot of, say, Western countries Mm. where the experiences of immigration dates a lot further in history and also the presence of immigrants are more substantial than it is in a country like South Korea. We do see immigration, growing immigration happening. There are a lot more foreigners now than there were, say, 20 years ago. But even so, the numbers are still quite low. It's just 3.5% of residents uh, in South Korea are foreigners. So I wouldn't say that this is a grand plan to address all demographic issues that South Korea as a society has at the moment because it's a little more substantial than that. You know, the aging population, the low birth rate, it's more serious than what can be addressed perhaps by 3.5% of the population. But 
It's part of a larger scheme, I would say. It's a start. They're doing other things um, in social policies, you know, the, the changes in women's policy and work-life balance, they call it, is another aspect. So I'd say it's part of a scheme to address the challenges in changing society. You wrote in 2012 uh, an academic paper with the assertion that Korean, the Korean conception of multiculturalism is actually based on neoliberal ideas. So can you maybe explain what neoliberalism means in this context of migration? South Korea's migration policies only began after adoption of what's called neoliberal consensus among government bureaucrats post-97. This consensus focus on market values, and this is not just in economy, but also in social policies, labor policies, education, and pretty much in all aspects of governance. It includes not only outsourcing public services to private sector, but also you know, understanding and categorizing citizen and all members of society as deserving and undeserving, and assigning services with respect to whether or not they're deserving of these services. And those are dictated very much by market values. It's also this phenomenon of individualizing social services Hmm. and in relying on individual responsibility to provide for what should be public services. Tamuna policies are a specific area in a broader migration policy. Tamuna being multiculturalism. Tamuna Hmm. being multicultural because it relates exclusively to marriage migrants. And I should tell you why I call Tamuna and perhaps refrain from using the term multiculturalism, because Tamuna means a very specific thing in Korean social policies and also law. It has a legal definition in an act, I think its English name is Act Concerning Support for Multicultural Families. And Tamuna, which is multicultural, multicultural families are families made up of one foreign parent or one who was foreign but naturalized parent and a Korean parent. So it's a very specific term. And I've never seen a Korean government using the term multiculturalism. It's always tamunha and never tamuna chui, which is multiculturalism. We shouldn't be confusing or misunderstanding tamuna to mean or have any ramification in multiculturalism in their policy initiative because there are quite a large difference between what tamuna is and what uh, multiculturalism is. So when I, when I say multicultural families or multicultural policies, you should be imagining this quotation marks <laughs> hmm. around the term because that's how I use it. And when I say tamuna, uh, that's how I mean it. And neoliberal ideas are essential in understanding of um, these policies. Can you maybe explain the difference between tamuna and multiculturalism? Well, I think the definition of multiculturalism is very contentious Hmm. because, first of all, there is no so-called multicultural society in a lot of critics' eyes. But if we sort of understand or imagine it, it to be most ideal form, where it embraces diversity, plurality, you know, coexistence of culture. That has never been the focus of multicultural policies or tamuna policies, where the focus has been, you know, bringing in foreign women mm. into Korean family and making Korean families, right? So instead of, say, you know, educating the children of foreign languages or, you know, educating the public to be more open to other culture, other nationalities, you know, the educating tolerance or, you know, all these good things that mm. are associated with uh, multiculturalism, so to speak, that has never been the focus. Rather, it has been to educate foreign women of Korean language, Korean culture, how to make kimchi, um, things like that. You read that Korea has no immigration laws um, as such. There are the basic laws on treatment of foreign residents, which you say are class-based and gendered. The word migrant worker actually doesn't even appear in the law, I think. Um, what do you mean by class-based and, and gendered? What was the idea of the, of the legislative body mm. when they wrote that law? Class and gender are two of the important markers 
that Korean government understands and regulates foreign populations. There are many ways that they do this. One example is overseas Korean visa. So for example, I'm a Canadian citizen. I was born South Korean. As someone who was born South Korean or someone who was born to South Korean parents, you are entitled to this visa that can be renewed every two years indefinitely. So there is no end date in visa unless you do something wrong, of course. And so does everyone else born in or in the similar predicament, provided that they are OECD citizens. So if you have a passport from OECD countries, you can take advantage of this visa. Now, if you are Chinese or Russian or other Central Asian, it gets a little trickier because the immigration office wants to make sure that you're not involved in what they call unskilled profession. You have to prove that you are skilled. So they have tests to make sure that you're skilled. Um, university degree is one example, or record of entries. So if you're a frequent flyer between China and Korea, if you have some sort of trade license or a certificate, um, that could be taken as a sign that you're not an unskilled profession. It doesn't work. In my, I mean, I, my research talks about how there are so many loopholes and it doesn't generally fall through that way. But that's just one instance of how class-based aspect plays a role here. In terms of gender, another example is migration visa, where more than 80% of visa holders F6 visa, uh, which is marriage migrant, uh, marriage migration visa, are women, where the expectation is that women assimilate into men's family and become part of Korean families. Hmm. Um, and this is, as I said, clear in social policies, especially terminal policies, where the focus is um, integration. Does this uh, neoliberal uh, multiculturalism, or maybe I shouldn't use that word anymore, mm. uh, does it imply that most immigration policies are first dictated by economic or, or business interests? Uh, you write about how Korean elites are quite obsessed with the idea of global competition and economic success, and so uh, if there is an, an immigration policy to be mm. had, it has to be useful. I think the Korean immigration or the Ministry of Justice, where the Office for Immigration sits under, would very much like to have what they call, you know, high pay or highly skilled people from OECD country to come to Korea. So there's much interest in, you know, attracting what they call foreign talents mm. and foreign investment. I'm not an expert on that, so I, I'm not, perhaps I'm not the best person to say. But I know in policy-wise there, there is much interest there. I also know Number-wise, they're a minority among foreign population. Tamuna policy, as a matter of fact, the multicultural policy, as a matter of fact, is more a welfare policies than something that's dictated by economic and business interests. So there's a difference between sort of immigration policies and multicultural policies, as I said. I remember a news report, I think last year, where the reporter problematized this woman who I think had a foreign citizenship, perhaps married to Korean, living in Gangnam. And because she was, leg by, by legal definition, a multicultural family because she had a child, she was entitled to all these uh, benefits that the public perhaps thought wasn't suitable for someone like her. You know, it's meant for someone in more dire circumstances than a Korean American living in Gangnam. I think that's a public understanding mm. of multicultural policies and multicultural families. Um, South Korea is by no means the, the only country with this neoliberal understanding of, of migration. Is the South Korean conception unique though, and how do you compare it with, with other countries? Neoliberal lens, of course, doesn't apply exclusively to South Korea. Migration in its current te contemporary form is very much driven by globalization and that globalization is very uniquely neoliberal. But Korea's migration policies are unique, of course, because it's a unique country. But you can draw comparisons from other countries or from other regions, of course. Uh, marriage migration is a scheme. You know, there are other comparisons in, 
East Asia and countries like Singapore, Taiwan, and Japan. Co-ethnic migration or Chosonjok migration, migration of、um, ethnic Koreans from elsewhere, is quite unique. And also, employment permit system, the circular labor migration system, is、um, is also unique. They are dictated by neoliberal ideas, so you can find comparison elsewhere in that sense. Yes,、so、we were、uh, we were thinking of the the neoliberal aspects of. The U.S. or the Australian system—they、uh, are quite straightforward、mm. about this idea of having a point system, and then、mm. you qualify or you do not.、Um, and I think South Korea, to that extent, goes in that direction, right? Of, of usefulness, of, of utility behind migration. Yeah, this idea of sort of having someone or inviting someone for their use, which is a different idea than inviting a person, right? Sure, you can say that, but actually, point system isn't. So relevant in contemporary immigration policies anymore, even in places like Canada, where who are basically the pioneers of the point system. They started very early. I'm not sure if the U.S. ever had a point system. But Australia also、mm. relies on point system for permanent residents. But permanent residents is becoming less relevant in contemporary migration as more countries rely on temporary migration. This transition, sort of transition from temporary work visa to more permanent forms of visa,、uh, is a major form of migration in Australia. For instance, a scholar, Australian scholar named Peter Mayer, he called it a "try it before you buy" policy, where <laughs> the PR is conditioned on your, you know, basically、mm. performance in the labor market and your desirability. There, there has been a transition from, you know, point system、um, in the West. So you write about、um, about the multicultural rhetoric in, in Korea. You write that it's part of the state's new nation building discourse. So maybe can you explain what you meant by that? I think it's it's not every day that we hear that there is a connection between nation building and multiculturalism. At the time when I wrote the paper, there was an optimism associated with Korea becoming a multicultural society, and you know, sort of recovering, finally, its obsession with ethnic homogeneity.、Mm. So there was some optimism there. At the same time, there was, you know, pessimism、um, associated with the fact that so-called multicultural policies has nothing to do with multiculturalism. So what I wanted to do is. Offer an alternative rhetoric. First of all, not taking ethnic homogeneity、uh, as a nation-building discourse not for granted, but sort of digging into how that discourse came into place. You know, in the '60s and '70s, related to its modes of production and the need to mobilize people and demand people to sacrifice. For the good of、uh, all, and the all is you because you you are the same people, right? So that sort of rhetoric was at the back of you know previous nation building discourse.、Mm. What, what about wanted, today? What about today? What I wanted to offer is sort of changing nation building discourse, which relies on you know neoliberal ideals of you know market values and making yourself useful you know making yourself deserving of all these services and individualizing services which is a change distinct change and it it it's related to how Korea, south korean economy you know restructured especially after 97、um, financial crisis and multicultural policy the multicultural rhetoric is a part of a broader changes in nation building discourse Isn't multiculturalism, though, essentially a threat to the Korean nation? There is this belief, I think, in Korea that Koreans are all the same. That there is this kinship.、Um, so, isn't there like a fundamental, I would say, dichotomy between multiculturalism, whatever its form, and Korean identity, the nation? I don't know, because <laughs> I don't think I think it's naive to think. That ethnic homogeneity is essential to being Korean. There are studies on how widespread naturalization practice practices were in late Joseon Dynasty, for example. That wasn't that long time ago.、Mm. That was just a hundred years ago. You know, this obsession with blood I don't think is essential to some sort of South Korean identity. 
even if multiculturalism becomes, you know, sometime in the future, you know, more prone to accepting or promoting diversity, plurality, and all these things, you know, accepting other cultures, I, I think it's a, a leap to call it a threat to South Korean mm. identity. But at the same time, I think we can ask, is, is having the Korean citizenship enough to become Korean? Um, if you look, for example, at what's happening with Jasmine Lee, the, the very mm-hmm. first non-Korean ethnic member of Congress, mm-hmm. she's frequently the target of, of racist mm-hmm. and sexist comments, despite the fact that she's a Korean citizen, and I think it is definitely linked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. It's, it's a problem. So that's why I use the idea of um, substantive citizenship and legal citizenship differently. Right. So there is a difference between where your legal citizenship is and the extent to which you could practice your citizenship. I think there's a lot to criticize about the Korean multicultural model. Um, But then shouldn't the initial assessment be actually quite positive? Because after all, Korea has focused its entire nation building discourse on homogeneity, on its uniqueness, and then now suddenly a shift towards multiculturalism. And isn't that actually a very bold move despite how, how flawed it may be. It could be. I don't, I don't deny it. And I, I hope it, it is at some point, you know, where the Multicultural Support Center stops teaching or the, their focus stops being, you know, teaching women how to speak Korean or how to address their in-laws or how to make kimchi and, and, and whatnot. Hmm. But you have to, I mean, we have to understand the definition of multicultural families is such that they wouldn't be called multicultural families in other countries. I mean, you're looking at one foreign parent and one Korean parent and children born and bred here. So in a lot of countries, that wouldn't even be multicultural family. It would be, you know, English or French or Canadian. So there's a labeling sort of aspect to start with. But sure, there is, you know, as a multiculturalism and ideas of multiculturalism at some point in the future is, mm. is on hope. A lot of European countries struggle with the variety of cultures within their borders, uh, which have so far not yet resulted in, I would say, a truly multicultural or integrative national culture. Does you, do you think Korea aspire to the European model? Or is migration something that is meant to fit, as I think you mentioned, into the homogeneous status quo? And that, that is a rationale, and it's not going to go beyond that, that box. Korea is very cautious of developments and ethnic conflicts in other countries, especially in the West, in in Europe and North America. So the government bureaucrats are very aware of this and they want to make sure that they do everything to prevent this. But of course you have to ask them to see what they want to do. Like I said, the population is still very small. It's just 3.5%. And the focus of the immigration has been very much integration. So I'd say they're aware of it and they're doing what they can to prevent it. You mentioned the difference between legal and substantive uh, citizenship. Is it possible for uh, a foreigner who comes to Korea and eventually through the whole process of naturalization gets the legal citizenship? When can he or she become a substantive citizen? I think it is possible, very much possible. It is difficult because in substantive citizenship, there, there are different social dimensions that prevents you from practicing full citizenship. Like I said, class is one, gender is another, ethnicity, you know, income, profession, geographic area of residence, whether you're an urban dweller, a rural dweller. You know, there are uh, many dimensions that can help you or prevent you from practicing your full citizen entitlement. So I think it is difficult, but possible. We've talked about Jasmine Lee because substantive citizenship is a multi sort of dimensional um, citizenship. You know, in some sense, her citizenship is better practiced than say some members of Korean population who are born and bred here. Mm. She's a politician. She participates in decision making. Her political participation is, of course, by far a lot better than anyone else who's not an MP. Right. So if you compare her against someone who can't go to vote because she can't get a day off work or hmm. something, right? her political participation is, of course, a lot better. Sure, she's an example of 
um, someone who's practicing uh, citizenship more substantively than someone who was born here. In the context of uh, South Korea, the influx of foreign women for the purpose of marriage is especially notable. You already talked about it. Over the past years, about 10 to 12 percent of all marriages in Korea involved a foreigner. 75 percent of these marriages involved a Korean man. Why is Korea, so to say, importing women for the purpose of marriage? I'm not sure about the word importing, but in terms of why do governments welcome women to come to South Korea for a marriage and encourage them to, um, to come. The official discourse is that there is gender imbalance in rural areas. And as you know, it's been hard for men in rural areas to find their match. Hmm. Also, South Korea has very low birth rate in aging society. So it's been critiqued by many that mig marriage migration was sought as an easy way out of its more pandemic demographic problems. Mm -hmm. The domestic situation in Korea explains why men seek brides from abroad. Why do foreign women would agree to this, to leave their home, their culture, and usually their, their family behind? What's, what's their side of the deal? There are many explanations for this. Um, one more classic one, uh, and this just doesn't, it doesn't apply to just South Korea, but marriage migration to elsewhere, like in the West, is that men look for so-called traditional wives, whereas women look for so-called modern husbands. Mm. So Korean bureaucrats know this, and I've heard them call it, it's a Korean saying, um, one bed, two dreams, <laughs> where uh, men and women want different things, and what they want is opposite of uh, each other. Men, many men, many Korean men who marry foreign wives complain about Korean women being too, you know, worldly and too, uh, you know, desiring independence and being too picky and selective. Uh, they don't listen to their husbands, and they want someone to come and do the housework for them and, you know, give birth to their babies. Um, on the other hand, for women, you know, Korea as a culture and, and society has been penetrating in even small villages of Southeast Asia through, you know, mass media like K-pop or, or drama and internet. So they're exposed to ways of what they imagine as a way of Korean living in life in here against the broader structure of uneven development globally and limited opportunities that can exist for women in employment and education, they desire to have a better life and more comfortable life in, in, in Korea. Um, and they want to be able to, you know, have a job, hmm. be able to send their parents some remittances, you know, help their siblings through school and things like that. So they want a you know, more comfortable life. And that's why they choose to come to, many choose to come to South Korea. You know, there, there are different groups of people. Another group in, in marriage migrant, of course, is um, a unification church, which um, the story is, is a little different there because they come for religious, uh, religious reasons. To get back to the neoliberal character of migration in Korea, is it fair to say that these women are, to put it very bluntly, embraced merely for their ability to give birth, to increase the birth rate of Korea, do house chores, um, but not really as individuals. <laughs> I think it's a little more complicated than that, mm. but official discourse is that opening entry for marriage migrants has been justified by low birth rate, aging society, uh, fleeting rural population and other demographic problems. For migrant women, one of the uh, manifestations uh, uh, is that their access to certain entitlements in Korea depends on whether they gave birth to a child there. I think you already mentioned that with the Gangnam story. Can you maybe explain how it works, how as a, foreign, as a migrant woman, how do you get access to some advantages such as path uh, to citizenship? Well, give birth to a child or stay married. So mm -hmm. the temporary visa, sorry, marriage migration visa F6, which is a temporary visa because you have to renew it every year or two, sometimes less, depends on your identity as a wife or mother because your visa depends on either your husband or your South Korean child. So a child that you gave birth to in South Korea um, to a South Korean husband. Women can stay on F6 visa indefinitely as long as they're one of the two 
roles, right? So if they're not married, say they're divorced, then their visa would depend on their children, unless in some special circumstances where a divorce was to the fault of um, her ex-husband, mm. whether you know there was an instance of domestic violence or her ex-husband has died and she was widowed. And the citizen pathway to citizenship is open if they are married without children or vice versa. Mm. So if they have children and, and are not married, it's also open. Nowadays, they have to take integration class, which takes a long time, or write an exam. And these exams are difficult. And uh, if you're divorced, you have to write a written exam, which is more difficult. Speaking of domestic violence, in one of your papers, you cite a study by the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family from 2007, uh, according to which 47.7% of foreign wives have experienced domestic violence. And the experts say that it's uh, more likely than not uh, of an underestimate. What is the, the context of this of this really shockingly high number? How do, how do we explain it? So the number is from a survey that's conducted by the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family Affairs. And the survey is conducted every three years. Multicultural families, the families from international marriages, is one component of that survey. The survey measures the instances of domestic violence, not just physically, but also psychological violence, as well as sexual abuse and neglect. In the re more recent one, they also included control. The measure of domestic violence in South Korean society as an overall is quite high, actually. That same year where I quoted, which is 2007, about 40% of Korean married partners reported to have experienced some form of domestic violence in the past year. Multicultural families have reported 7% higher than um, other Korean families. But generally, I should tell you that the, the level of domestic violence is quite high here, and mm. that's why there are two separate laws on you know, preventing and punishing the instances of domestic violence. Violence against migrant women is a very serious issue. Um, last year alone, seven migrant women were murdered, six of them marriage migrants, and all of them were murdered by their husbands, boyfriends, or romantic partners. And there are many reasons why this is a profound uh, phenomenon um, in the, why the incidence of domestic violence is high among marriage migrants. Because of a system by which they're brought into the country, they often have little knowledge of society, laws, and institutions. They have a limited command over Korean language, and this limits social resources, especially if they're new to the country, in terms of who they can contact for help, uh, information and refuge, lacking friends and kinship network, and surrounded by families and friends of husbands, uh, exacerbates um, such phenomenon. The economic violence was especially high uh, because domestic violence also includes economic violence, and that's representative of a fact that a lot of multicultural families are low-income households. Their legal uh, status is precarious because, as I said, their visa depends on their husbands often, and their visa is temporary. So in times of abuse and violence, many women feel trapped because they feel like they have to stay married and they're not able to escape, otherwise they'll be sent back home. Although the Ministry of Justice says the husband's consent are not required when they acquire PR or citizenship and move on to more permanent forms of visa. But in practice, this is not the case. They're often asked to have their husbands accompany them when they apply for PR or citizenship. Recently, Korea passed a law um, to prevent foreign spouses to come to Korea if they don't have a good enough command of, Korea, of Korean. And the idea was that, was that this would limit domestic violence. Um, do you think this policy will actually make a difference? Or are the causes of violence deeper than simple miscommunication and general frustration? I think the changes in um, enhancing the visa processing and the criteria for processing visa is generally a positive thing because it includes a variety of measures, not just testing the wife's command of Korean, but also 
ensuring some sort of minimum standards for husbands as well, whether they have adequate housing and also minimum income. I think the initiative is generally good, but implementation can be tricky because we have seen already growing of businesses in countries like Vietnam, for instance, where women are brought in and they are put into school that teaches them Korean, which incurs costs and which is economic burden to them. There is also lack of control mechanisms. So sometimes they marry and they register their marriage in foreign countries, say Vietnam, but their visa doesn't come out. So they have to live with the stigma of having married, but not being able to realize that marriage because the woman can't go to, uh, can't come to mm. Korea. Related to that, you write about um, how the idea of legitimate discrimination, so to speak, is, is quite prevalent in Korea. Under what circumstances does society and, and the courts consider discrimination to be a legitimate fact of life? One example is the limit on workplace transfer for EPS worker. They're limited by law to not change their workplace more than three times. So there's a explicit limit on the freedom of movement. And this could create a situation where workers are trapped with abusive employers when he's used up all three transfers over over five years of stay but cannot return because you know maybe their family's expecting remittances or he mm. still has debt uh, which it had incurred when coming to South Korea there are reported cases of human rights violation in those cases and it's been reported by many international you know, human rights organization hmm. and UN special repertoires. But as we saw in the constitutional court a couple of years ago, the court found the such limit constitutional because it still benefits national interest. Their limit was put there to benefit Korean industries. So that's why I called it in that paper, a legitimate discrimination. Hmm. This question might sound uh, naive, especially after all we've talked about but how good or bad is life for the majority of migrant women uh, in Korea? Does it usually lead to regrets all the time on the side of the women? Or does Korea does become a true home for some of them and hopefully for the majority of them? I think it's an individual question. I mean, it's hard for me to say. Mm. I think most women make the best out of what they can, given the circumstances in their home country, in their origin countries as well as here. So, yeah, perhaps make a time to meet up with one of them and ask. <laughs> <laughs> So who need to conclude maybe, um, do you see Korea on the right track and on one that provides solutions for issues such as the lack of women in the countryside, the low birth rate, the, the weakening welfare state, but also the problems that many migrants and, and foreigners face here? What's your assessment of the current situation and maybe the, the outlook? I think the policies are constantly changing, but the changes I don't think occur in one direction. I think it goes back and forth. It takes a combination of initiative program details and implementation. So one instance is the changes in processing of visa um, that we talked about. It might have been, the initiative might have been good, but in terms of what it entailed and how it required transnational coordination and interministerial coordination and what came as a result of implementation on the ground is quite complicated. Mm -hmm. So I can't say that they're on the right track. But my position, my, my, my argument is, it's still part of this broader neoliberal nation-building discourse. Instead of commenting on whether it is on the right track or not, I should leave it at that. And perhaps not focus so much on the government, but the grassroots movement that the government initiative and government policies and the discourse have ignited and perhaps find the hope there. <laughs> so Hun Lee, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.